Hello explorers and welcome to another video. Today we are going to talk about autoscaling in Kubernetes. This autoscaling tutorial that I'm going to go through today is going to go through two different um, strategies for autoscaling. So what am I talking about? Scaling a Kubernetes cluster. Well, in a Kubernetes cluster you have a deployment with some replica sets. And a replica set, you can think of that as an application that you install. So you can have a MySQL uh, database and you can have a web application. And those are two replica sets in one deployment. But if you have, for instance, your web server and you get a large load to that web server. It has lots of traffic. It might get overrun and it actually needs more power. And then in a Kubernetes cluster, you can in this replica set say that I want two web servers or three or four or hundreds. But if you don't want to use all that power every time, every, uh, all the time, you want it to actually grow and shrink depending on how much load you have on your site. And this auto scale that we are going to look to today is we are going to look at two different examples. So we are going to look at how to auto scale depending on how much CPU load you have on your system. So if you have a high CPU load, we will put in more uh, thing, more pods into our replica sets. And if we have less of a workload, we will uh, decrease it. And the same goes for the other thing we are going to look to is when you have a worker that's going to process some work in a rabbit MQQ and if it has too many work, uh, work to do it will actually scale up so it has more workers and when the queue has hand been handled it will scale down as well. So let's jump over to this example here and I have a repository and this is the readme file for that repository so if you want to follow along look in the description down below and go to that repository. And the RabbitMQ uh, example I took some inspiration from this git repository here and the other scaling uh, example is taken from a guide on the Kubernetes homepage but I will go through it so you see which different things are required in order to do the different operations and we will see how it actually uh, is working. First off we need some prerequisites. We need to install uh, docker tools, minikube, cube uh, control and helm and the minikube I will use as my Kubernetes cluster. Cube control is the command you use to actually control your cluster uh, Docker tools I use to build the Docker image for the Rabbit MQ auto scaling, and Helm I will use to install packages directly into your uh, Kubernetes cluster. So Helm is a package manager where you can get some packages. In this case, a Rabbit MQ server directly from the internet and install it in your environment. So here you have some links to download those tools, uh, so you can follow along. Uh, next up I have this little path here that I set and that is where I have installed all these tools so I will add those to my environment here so I actually have the tools available. Next up we will start our Minikube cluster and as you see here I started it a little bit earlier and what it does here it's, uh, it creates a VirtualBox VM with two CPUs some memory and some disk and start that up as my minikube cluster. So that's what's going on here. Uh, next up we need to install the Kubernetes metrics server and the metrics server is something that will keep tabs on how much CPU uh, power is used by a specific pod in my cluster or a specific replica set. So it will actually, and it also gives you a lot of other different metrics, but it's actually some way to measure things in your Kubernetes cluster and giving you an API to get those values out. 
And you can either install this with Cube Control and this link here that goes directly to the GitHub page where they uh, work, work on that uh, specific server. Uh, but in a Minikube setup, that will not work as well. So this is for a more production ready uh, deployment when you are working with a standard Kubernetes cluster. But Minikube had actually added this as an add-on. So we can go in and list the add-ons that are available in our Minikube environment when this has been created. And one of those add-ons should be the uh, server. If we run the uh, Minikube add-ons list, we can see here that we have a lot of different add-ons that we could add to our environment. What I want to enable here is the metrics server. So that's one of these add-ons that we want to use now in order to see how much CPU load is actually taken up by a specific service. And next up, we will install a little bit, a little application. And this application is very simplistic. If you are going to this application, it will count, uh, count through a large number of numbers and figure out the square root of all those numbers. So it will just get, uh, bring some load to your system. So it's nothing special and this is um, mentioned in the guide. We will not go through that code. I will just put that application into my environment. Next up, I will uh, put on this auto scale command here. So cube control auto scale deployment. And the application that I installed before was called PHP Apache. And I want that application to be running at most as uh, CPU intensive as 50%. So if it has m runs harder than 50%, I want more of it. And I want minimum of one pod and I want a maximum of 10 pods. So that's my configuration here. So I put in some auto scaling. If you are creating a deployment from scratch with a lot of different applications, there is a way to configure auto scaling in that deployment with a horizontal auto scaling unit. And that is also um, mentioned in the guide. So if you go through that and read through and configure it that way, you can get auto scaling with your deployment. But we are going through just to see how it actually works uh, in our environment. Uh, next up, I will look at the actual auto scaling. So we can do that with kubectl uh, uh, get HPA. So this is horizontal uh, scaling. And here you see that I have a minimum of one pod, a maximum of 10 pods. I have one replica in my replica set and it has lived for 46 seconds. But you see here that the target here is unknown. So the, the system, the metric server, doesn't really have as much metrics yet, so you can say how much it actually runs through. So this takes a little while to actually update and give you a result on how much load it actually runs. So we will uh, wait for that to update. It usually takes a few minutes to update. So now we are back and you can see here that it uses 1% CPU, uh, this target, and we have 50% to go with. So let's go back to our example here and see that we will now set up something that will generate some load on the system. So let's start this one. It's a, it will run this load generator and it's a specific image busybox and just give us a shell in that busybox. So this is a very simple little Linux environment that we will install and we get a command prompt. And in this Linux environment, we want to run this command here. And this command will, while it's true, just go in and um, we get the specific URL here that will call this PHP Apache application 
over and over again and, and start the flow of actually calculating these numbers. This means that we put some load on the system. And again, this uh, little environment here will not opt update directly. It takes a while for the metrics to actually uh, be propagated out and read. It doesn't read it automatically uh, every time. So it's scaling up a little bit slow. It takes the time to uh, gather the metrics and when it has those, it will scale it up. So we will wait for a couple of minutes and we will see that it actually scales up. So now we see here that we already have 84% CPU usage and we have scaled up to two replicas. So we have already been able to put some load on the system and scale it up a bit at least. And if we put heavier load on the system with even more CPU usage, it will scale even higher. So now I've waited for a little bit longer again and you see here that it actually has figured out that I need four replicas because we have 173 uh, percent CPU usage at the moment, so we need to scale it up to even more replicas. So let's try now to turn this off and wait for the system to come down and actually uh, scale down these replicas. So I will be back when that has happened. So now we can see that we already have come down to 89% CPU usage and in a little while the replicas will also be scaled down to a few less. Let's see here, it takes a while for it to turn those replicas off when it has noticed that it actually has scaled down. You can see now that it has actually scaled down to two pods in our replica. And I also started the Kubernetes dashboard by using Minikube dashboard. And even in this dashboard, you can also see that the two pods are running here. We have one, two running desired two, and it, we can also see how, how they fare inside here, what, what, what's happening in the specific environment. But it is, doesn't really matter what the uh, application does at the moment, we are only interested in how we can scale it up and down. So I will reset the environment and get back to you when we are going to talk about how to do the same thing using a RabbitMQ uh, scaling instead. And we are back and you see here that I have deleted the old Minikube and started a new one. So now we have a fresh environment with Kubernetes with no auto scaling, no application or anything like that. So let's start off by adding the application again. So we want this PHP application. We will use the same application for this example in order to scale it up and down. Doesn't really matter what it does. We just need something that we can scale. Then we will create a little bit of a namespace for rabbits. We have somewhere to put this installation. We will add a repository called Bitnami where the uh, current in, in where the rabbit MQ package is available for us. We will download and install this uh, rabbit MQ package. We will call it MU rabbit inside of our uh, Kubernetes cluster. We will take it from bitnami slash rabbit MQ and we will put it into the namespace rabbit. So this will create a fully functional rabbit system in our environment. And we can use that and then port forward the control panel down here. But before we do that, we actually need the password to log in. So by running um, this little command here, cube control secret. Uh, so this will get the secret from the namespace rabbit, the application mu rabbit MQ, and then output that to a JSON part, uh, path, look for data rabbit MQ password, and it's base64 encoded, so we will decode that password. So now we have the password to log into that environment here, and we also need to start the actual rabbit MQ port forward in here so we can log into 
this dashboard. So there we have that. And if we go over here and go to localhost and port 15672, which is the standard port for RabbitMQ, it should get us into the RabbitMQ environment. We will type in user, add this uh, strange little password. And here I want actually to go into admin and change the password. Um, you might not uh, need to do that. I can uh, just change it to test123 to make it easy for myself. Oh no, we don't want to add a user. We want to change the password of this user. So we have that down here, test123, test123. We still want it to be administrator. And it says login failed. It's a little bit strange that it actually says that you are not logged in anymore when you're changing the password but that's how <laughs> RabbitMQ works. Uh, and we also need a queue that we can have here. So we create something that I call test queue. And if you're using RabbitMQ for something, you actually want to put up an exchange that can route your different uh, messages to different queues. But I just want a queue so I can have something to read from. And I will put some payload in that queue so let's just publish one message here and we will see here that we have published this message and we will probably have one message in our queue. So you see here re ready, one message. So now we have something that we can read in the uh, application later on. So let's head back to uh, our example here. So now we have RabbitMQ set up. Now we need to actually build our application. But before we build that application, we will go through it a little bit and talk about what's in the application. So first off, we have this deployment here where we set up a cluster role that gives us access to get the current pods, list some data and update the deployment so we can actually say, well, I want more pods or less pods. Then we have this service account here for the cube system and all this application will be installed into the cube system namespace. It's not actually required. You need to have uh, the ability to change things, but I don't think you actually need to have this application running in the cube system. Uh, at least we don't have that at work and it seems to work anyway in our setup. And then you set up some cluster role binding just to give you the, this service account, the accessibility to change the deployment. Next up down here, we have uh, a setup where one replica, we don't need multiple repli uh, replicas of this scaling application. And we will use the uh, image that I will create down here. So I just call it class buffer and cube auto scaling example. And uh, we'll never pull it from the internet because it will not exist. It's just something that I build locally. And then we have down here some settings. We have an interval of 30 seconds. So it will check every 30 seconds, has something changed? We have a rabbit host here, and this is something that we need to look up. We have a rabbit user and this password test123. And then we have this auto scaling. And this is a little bit of a long uh, line, but you can put in multiple lines here. Uh, so you can actually have two or three or hundreds of scaling examples, but it will look in the queue and see if we have one to, uh, if we will have one to five pods. So it will give us the range of one to five pods. And it says that during these 30 seconds, we expect these pods, one pod, to handle five messages. So if we have more than five messages, we will probably need another pod to handle the access excess um, messages. And then we say that in the default namespace, we have an application called PHP Apache. And we also want to look in this test queue for the number of um, queued up work that is available. We have a high threshold for the logs. 
And we also want Slack hook. We can put in a Slack hook here and it will actually post a message to Slack when it scales up and down. And we have that running in our uh, production environment. And it's quite uh, satisfying to see that when it gets a lot to do, it scales up a bit and then it scales down again. But we need to have this IP here. So we want to st start up the dashboard again. So I will start the Minikube dashboard here. It will open up a URL there where we can look into uh, this IP that we are missing at the moment. So here we have the RabbitMQ or the Kubernetes dashboard. And we want to go into the Rabbit naming space and we want to look at this current um, installation here. So we have a cluster IP for this specific rabbit MQ. And we will take that cluster IP, copy that over. Let's see, uh, let's go in here. Yeah, so in here we have an endpoint for this uh, cluster. <laughs> so it's the endpoint IP that we want. So we copy that one over, put it in here. So let's uh, go over to uh, our configuration here. So we put that IP address in. Now we want to build this application and put it into our system. So we will first off set up the Docker environment. So this is running Minikube Docker env will give us the different settings we need to put into our environment for Docker to uh, be our Docker commands to be able to contact the Minikube environment re repository for images. And that's required so we can actually build things into the uh, Kubernetes environment. If you have a large Kubernetes setup, you will actually do this uh, with an, a, a repository that you have in the cloud. So now I'm running Docker build with the tag name that we said earlier in this uh, directory that will take that Docker file that we uh, looked at earlier and create an application, put this auto scale SH into that application and uh, put it into the uh, Kubernetes environment. And we can also look at it, this auto scale. It's just an application where you uh, will check for the current pods. It will type out a message how many are the current pods running. And if it finds out that the desired pods or required pods are lo uh, larger or less than the current pods, it will actually do some scaling. You can look at this code more in detail if you like. Down here you see that we have different failed attempts that we can do and it will actually send you some information to Slack if something fails. Uh, it's a really interesting and good written script, so it's quite easy to follow, but I will not uh, go through it in this video. So now that we have built this, we want to deploy it on our Kubernetes environment. So let's go down here and so there we have this cube system apply and this YAML file that we looked at earlier. So now it has pushed that into our environment. I don't know if we actually looked at the Docker file, but it's just a very simple Docker file. It's an Alpine Docker file. We add curl and a lot of other things just to fetch the cube control command. And then we'll copy over our script and set some environment variables here as well. So these are set twice, perhaps not required, but uh, that's the way it uh, is set up. So let's see here, we have our environment here. Let's see if we have actual data here. So we, some errors where it what, doesn't really want to handle connections. Don't really know what that is all about, but it seems that we have a connection now. So let's uh, publish a message here. It should uh, come up here later on. So now we see that we have something in queue. We go into our uh, uh, namespace of the cube system. We will find this autoscaling pod here. 
and look at the logs for that. You can see here that it has checked and the PHP Apache has one pod and we have no messages in the rabbit queue. Uh, let's refresh that every five seconds. So we will see when it changed. Now I have put something into, into the queue. So now you see that it updated here. We have one message in the queue and I will publish a few more messages. Let's go for, uh, let's say uh, 10 or so, somewhere in that range. So it's uh, gradually increasing here up to 11 messages. Let's go back here and see when this updates. We see 11 messages. It scales up to two pods in order to handle the load. And uh, so that was immediate. If we are, if we copy this over and go into the environment again and look at the, uh, let's see the right namespace here, the default namespace. We see that we have two pods running in this, uh, Apache set up. Let's go into the rabbit queue and purge the messages. So we don't have anything in our queue anymore. So we will have zero pods in the queue. So these are still current 10, 11 pods. Now we have zero. When this updates, it will probably scale down to, try to scale down to one pod again. See here, uh, it takes 30 seconds to update. There we have it, it's scaled down to one pod again. And if we go into the Kubernetes environment for these pods, we see that we have one cube pod running at the moment. So this is what I wanted to cover today. I wanted to talk about how to auto scale using the CPU load of your system and also how to auto scale if you have a worker that goes through a bunch of work in a rabbit queue and scale it up and down depending on how much work this worker actually has to do. Uh, I hope that you found this video interesting. I hope that you learned something today. Are you using any techniques to auto scale your Kubernetes environment? Please leave a comment down in the comment section down below. Or if you have any questions or suggestions, leave them there too. If you like this video, give it a like, share it with your friends and colleagues. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. And I really hope to see you in the next video.